We'll be reading verses 1 through 12, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and I'm reading in the English Standard Version. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we submit ourselves to the authority of your word, as you speak, just as we've been asking in our song, that we, we ask that you would speak, Lord. Let your, let your word ring out in this place clearly and plainly and understandably. Lord, I pray that you would uh, remove any distraction, anything that would take away from us hearing and receiving your word and the message this conveys for us. I pray, Lord, for anyone here today who, or listening online who, who might have a wall up, a, 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 a system of defenses in place, a hand out to hold you at arm's length. I pray you would sweep those things away and remove those obstacles, take down those barriers. I pray, Lord, that the word that you gave to Matthew to write, recording the sermon and the preaching and the ministry of John the Baptist will pierce, that you will bring fruit for repentance, that you will bring receptiveness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you will stir up fresh embers of faith in the salvation, the mercy, the righteousness, the good news of Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to take up our offering just as uh, we begin here. And if you are a regular with Beacon Church, thank you for your generosity. It's much appreciated. As you, if you are a guest with us visiting, please feel zero obligation to give to the ministry of the church. That would be a bit weird, like inviting you over for lunch and asking you to pay for the meal. So in no way do we want to do that. We're just glad you're here. If you're at home and joining us online, we encourage you to go to our website, bcchurch.ca slash giving, and you can see there how you can continue to support the ministry of this church. In our sermon series on the Gospel of Matthew, uh, titled The Kingdom, uh, the title of this sermon here is The Man Who Heralded God's Son. The Man Who Heralded God's Son. There's a story in 2 Samuel 24, right at the end of 2 Samuel, that's, that's always intrigued me. When Israel and its king, David, had, had so provoked God to wrath, that he visited his wrath on Israel in the form of a plague, we read in 2 Samuel 24, it was an angel. The means by which God visited in a plague on the people of Israel was by an angel. And just when the plague was about to strike Jerusalem, God relented. He, he, had, he turned to mercy instead of wrath. And God relented of his own free will and told his angel responsible for that destruction to cease, to stop. And it, it tells us in the text, and this is the part that's always intrigued me, it tells us in that text that King David looked out and he saw the angel. It's all about it. It's quite remarkable in that text. It doesn't say that David looked out and saw the angel and said, well, that's what angels look like. 
that was the furthest thing from his mind. It wasn't curiosity, it wasn't fascination, it was fear. David looked out and he saw the angel of the Lord standing on that hilltop, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, ready to strike. Stop exactly where God told him to stop, exactly where he was when God told him to stop. On, on a hilltop overlooking Jerusalem, where there was a threshing floor that happened to belong to a man named Arauna, and that threshing floor is, well, I'll say that for later, that th threshing floor, that spot, became important in the history of Israel. A threshing floor. You know what a threshing floor is used for, for threshing, particularly for threshing wheat. The closest I've ever come to that was when I lived in the Philippines and learned to winnow rice and winnow out in the winnowing basket, the rice of the husks would blow away and you pick them out and it made the rice more desirable. A threshing floor does that with wheat. You, you beat the wheat until it separates from the, the chaff and, and you let the chaff uh, be swept away but you preserve the grain and, and you, you burn the chaff. And that's symbolic. The angel standing on that hilltop overlooking the city of Jerusalem where God said stop, where God restrained his wrath. And David saw it. And we read about what David saw in the text of scripture and we're reminded we serve a holy God. There is such a thing as the wrath of God. And that approach of God's wrath often has exactly that effect on people that threshing has on wheat. When God warns us and gives us an opportunity to repent before it's too late, separating the wheat from the chaff, as you will. And when you think about it, the time between the advent of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and his second advent, which we're still waiting for, when he comes again, that whole era in between, during which time the gospel is being preached to all nations, the whole era is kind of like a threshing floor. A 2,000 year long spiritual threshing, separating spiritual wheat from spiritual chaff, exactly what Adam has just been teaching us this morning. The approach of God's wrath looming has that effect on people. At the dawn of this age, God sent warning to give people the chance to repent. And in this third chapter of his gospel, Matthew describes the role of John the Baptist as a forerunner paving the way for the arrival of Jesus, the only person who can save you from the wrath of God. That's the big idea in this sermon. Matthew describes the role of John the Baptist as a forerunner paving the way for the arrival of Jesus, the only person who can save you from the wrath of God. And this is the big idea that I want to show in this text this morning as we're going to encounter John, called the Baptist or the baptizer, arriving before Jesus in verses 1 to 3, preparing people for Jesus in verses 4 through 6, and preaching about Jesus in verses 7 to 12. And so first, John arrived before Jesus. Luke tells us quite a bit about John in his gospel. It's the famous passage that we often read uh, sometime around Christmas, around Advent, how John's mother and father were righteous, how jo John's father was a priest, how John's father was visited by an angel of the Lord, uh, the unusual, even the miraculous birth of John's elderly mother, um, Elizabeth, conceiving John at her age, and so on. There's a lot of detail about John the Baptist in Luke's Gospel. But in Matthew's Gospel, John's brought into the story with no introduction. Just boom, there he is. We encounter John suddenly in Matthew's Gospel. He's just there. Look at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That's it. Suddenly he's just there. The, the Jews Matthew wrote this for originally probably didn't need any introduction to John. And that's a good thing because Matthew doesn't give one. It's like John bursts on the scene preaching and shaking things up. 
And notice what John preached. And this isn't a word-for-word -word transcript. This is a, a summary of the, the themes of his preaching in general. Look at verse 2. This is what John said. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I would love to know how many sermons were under that general theme. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Maybe if you are given to underlining things in your Bible, underline that word repent. I found this helpful definition of repentance somewhere. Turning from self and sin to God and grace. I like that. Repentance. Turning from self and sin to God and grace. The Greek word has the, the meaning of a, a changing of the mind. But if there's a true changing of the mind, the rest of the body should follow, right? If there's a true changing of the heart, the rest of the life should conform. Why? Why should people repent? Why is John preaching this? Because a kingdom from heaven, he said, is at hand. At hand. So John's a preacher who warned people to repent because something huge was coming. On the verge of happening. At hand. On the brink of arriving. The kingdom of heaven. He exhorted his hearers, repent. How did we define that just now? Turn from self and from sin to God and his grace. And the reason that John gives because of the kingdom of heaven being on the cusp. It's, it's not a destroying angel bearing down on the city of Jerusalem this time. It was much, much more serious than that. It was a kingdom bearing down from heaven on this whole world. And there are no walls high enough, there is no army big enough to keep this king away when he comes. So John preached. He preached to warn. He preached to warn people to repent. At this point, there's something else you need to notice here. Not only is the arrival of the king something that people should have expected. The scriptures warned about this for a long time. But even the king's forerunner is predicted. Even the arrival of this forerunner to the king was predicted long, long ago. Look at verse 3. For this is he, talking about John the Baptist, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. What is he crying? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Really, this is very unusual. Here we have Matthew quoting an ancient prophecy from Isaiah about the arrival of a prophet prophesying about the arrival of the Lord. Think of it. John. John the baptizer was the subject of a prophecy uttered 600 years before he was even born. He was arguably the most important VIP ever to make an appearance, a public appearance in Israel, ever. Jesus said so. Matthew 11, 11, Jesus declares that John is the greatest man ever to be born. I think that includes men and women. But that was Jesus' assessment. So then here, Matthew doesn't even give John a, a, a place for a proper introduction. He just, suddenly he's there. Preaching and teaching and calling people to repent. He's not, there's no spotlight on John particularly. He's almost incidental in this story. And the reason why should be what strikes us. He's just a herald. I don't mean like the name herald. Like my, uh, he's just a, her a herald, he, he's a, an ambassador, he's an emissary, he's a harbinger. John was important only because of the one coming after him. So verse 3, 
quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. It quotes from the Greek translation of that text, where that says, prepare the way of the Lord. The Hebrew in the original is a little less ambiguous than that. The Hebrew says, prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I think we should consider that Matthew obviously put a lot of thought into how he wrote his gospel. He didn't sit down and experience a stream of consciousness where he just kind of wrote, 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 and whatever came to mind. He thought this through. And so far in this sermon series, as, as we've looked at the gospel of Matthew to this point, we've learned about the genealogy, the family tree that led to Jesus. We learned about his miraculous virgin birth, about the dream in which the angel of God told Joseph to marry Mary and so in doing so to adopt her son Jesus. We learned about the pilgrimage of the wise men, the, the star that announced Christ's birth. Herod I, his plot to kill Jesus and the escape to Egypt before finally the coast was clear and another angel told Joseph to bring his family back, this time to Nazareth. And after the way Matthew chapter 2 ended, I, I said we should be expecting now that Jesus would begin his ministry in, in Galilee of the Gentiles. But what we find in Matthew chapter 3 is we turn that page. It's not Jesus beginning his ministry, it's John. We learn about John, the forerunner of God. That's what Isaiah said. John, the forerunner of God, that's who we learn about next. John, coming ahead and preparing the way. And the point is as plain as day. When we expected Jesus to begin his ministry, John is saying, God is coming. When John came to warn people God was coming, John was talking about Jesus. Another thing you should notice here. John doesn't go straight to the temple in Jerusalem where we'd expect him to go. He doesn't go to where the most religious people are. He doesn't go to where the most people gather. He doesn't go anywhere where there's people. He doesn't preach his message in the center of the city. And you can probably guess the reason. True prophets don't usually play nice with the establishment. If there's anything the 1960s taught us, if that was it. True pro well, there were no true prophets in the 90s. I don't know why I said that. But true prophets, they shake things up, right? When the authorities work so hard to build and, and construct their little fiefdoms, their little empires, their, their corner of the world, and God sends prophets, they end up tearing it all down. It's kind of the way prophets work in the Old Testament. A true prophet from God isn't usually a preacher who tells people what they want to hear. So that guy in that giant stadium in the southern states somewhere, he's not a true prophet. If you don't know who I'm talking about, great. If you do, a true prophet proclaims what people don't want to hear. Here the city was completely unprepared for the arrival of the conquering king. Jerusalem wasn't ready. God's temple, God's temple was in Jerusalem. God's temple was sitting on the very plot of land where once a man named Arauna owned a threshing floor. That was now God, the place of God's temple. You would think they would expect to, to, be, to be ready for God to come. God's people were not ready for his coming. So, Matthew, enter John the Baptist. And the next thing here is we read about how John prepared people for Jesus. That's the next point here, how John prepared people for Jesus. Look at me at verses 4 through 6. Later on in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew gives us a bit of a flashback where we learn that John the Baptist 
became an enemy of the king, sort of Herod II, the son of the first Herod. And we find out that sometime after this, that king had John beheaded. And I think John knew that he was poking the bear all the time. John was not stupid. But John was not afraid of rocking the boat. He was not afraid of offending the powerful. John was a prophet, and John knew that he was the prophet, Isaiah predicted, the forerunner of the Lord God. He was the voice of God. That's what verse 3 tells us. And John surely knew it. He is the voice. He saw himself that way. The late doctor Michael Green said that John's preaching shook the state, he said. He said his courage was phenomenal. And yet with striking humility, he sees himself as nothing more or less than the voice through which God was addressing his nation. He takes no credit for his ministry. He is simply his master's voice. And Dr. Green said, what an example to preachers. Isn't it though? Wouldn't you be happier if all the preachers in all the churches in all the world saw their ministry that way? Just a voice. The word of the Lord is everything. But John appears suddenly. He's suddenly, he's there preaching the word of the Lord. He just appeared. Speaking of John's appearing, Let's talk for a second about John's appearance. Because Matthew thinks it's important. Did you notice that? It's there as if we should notice it and learn something from this. The application when we get here to verse 4 is not about how we should dress next Sunday. John's a wild man who lived in the wild. Look with me at verse 4. John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his, this is not the Whole30 diet or the ketogenic diet or anything, weight, not Weight Watcher approved. John's food was locusts and wild honey. Why? Because you find them in the wild and you don't have to do anything to them. They grow on their own. He's a wild man who lived in the wild. His whole lifestyle is deliberately designed to show he rejected Judean society. He rejected Judean civilization. He rejected the centers of power and culture in his time. They had no, none of their hooks in him. Zechariah 13.4 mentions how centuries before John, apparently prophets used to wear hairy cloaks, cloaks of hair. Kind of like uniforms. I have no idea whether that was sort of like by choice or by necessity. That's maybe they lived out in the wild and that's the only kind of garment they could get made or something. I don't know. But it turns out that it becomes something that's recognizable. Like maybe in priests and today in certain denominations, not ours, but certain denominations might be recognized by a white collar around the neck. As if they're expecting people to, I don't know, string them up or something. But you could always spot a prophet, and that was the point. You could always spot a prophet by his hairy cloak, or his cloak of hair, according to Zechariah. So John dressed like a prophet. But Matthew is drawing attention to more here, more than just that. He's drawing attention to the fact that John is dressing like one particular prophet. There's a story in 2 Kings 1. I've always been intrigued by this story too, but it's about a certain king of Samaria who was sick. And he sent messengers to inquire of a foreign god. This is a, a king in the kingdom of northern Israel. And he sends messengers to a foreign god to ask if he's going to get better or if he's going to die. But as the messengers are on their way to inquire from that idol, a certain prophet of Israel intercepts those messengers and sends them back to the king with a message that he was going to die. When the king asked his messengers, here's the question. What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? The messengers described that prophet like this. They said, and compare this now to verse 4. 
They said, he wore a garment of hair with a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. 2 Kings 1.8. In other words, John's appearance wasn't just designed to make him look like any prophet. He dressed that way to make himself look like Elijah. And that might not seem like a big deal to us. But for first century Jews, it was equivalent to a sign of the end times. If you turn back just a couple pages in your Bible to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, the prophet Malachi, chapter 4, verse 1, you, you'll see this prophet, chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, I mean, you'll see this prophecy. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So John dressed like the famous description of Elijah so that Jews would realize he is that Elijah 2.0 that Malachi had predicted was coming to warn people before the day of God's wrath came. It was all foretold. And this explains why practically the whole country turned out to go to John. Verse 1 is pretty clear about the whole country went to hear him preach. The whole country was going to repent and going to be baptized. But it doesn't quite explain why they let John baptize them. Baptism as we know it today, forgiving our Lutheran brothers and sisters, baptism as we know it today in Baptist circles where you, you get dunked in a tank of water or as we prefer at Beacon Church, the ocean, the biggest tank of water there is. Our baptismal tank is superior to all other baptismal tanks. But the way we understand baptism, that was practically unheard of in the Old Testament. There were different washing rituals. There were pools around Jerusalem that indicated that, that it was well understood to, to ritually wash yourself in water as a as symbol of cleansing. But that was for worshipers. That was for people who are already sort of like in the church. Not long after this, in John's lifetime, there's some evidence that Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism were baptized. But they didn't go into a tank and have someone else dunk them. They dunked themselves. It was self-dunking. But here, people were going to John to get baptized by him in the Jordan River. The word baptizo in Greek means to dunk. That's all I'll say about that. And these people going to John were not Gentiles who wanted to be converted to Judaism. They were Jews. It was shocking. What he was doing was unheard of and scandalous. He was baptizing Jews, suggesting that they saw their need to repent in terms of a dramatic spiritual conversion as if they weren't really Jews. And they saw they couldn't do it for themselves, so he was baptizing them. The change that they recognized they needed in their hearts was something they could not perform on their own. Dr. France says that John's baptism then was a critique of contemporary Jewish society as no longer truly constituting the holy people of God. In plain English, John's baptisms, all the people that he baptized, meant nearly everyone agreed that the whole religious system had failed to make people holy, had failed to make the nation any holier, had failed to make Israel ready to meet her maker. Ready for that great and awesome day of the Lord that Malachi 4, 5 said is coming. So they were getting baptized by John. Doesn't John's ministry sound a little bit like one of the old-time revival meetings? People going out into the wilderness. Maybe that's where the idea of Bible camps comes from. I doubt it. But the thing that's familiar about Bible camp and 
retreats and old time revival meetings is that people went back to life. They go back to their daily lives. I do believe that many, many people's lives were really changed by their encounter with John the Baptist. Many people really believe that John was Elijah 2.0, a sign of the end times. But as we've lived through over 20 months of COVID, you know, even the guy who makes my tacos in the restaurant in Sydney, he asked me, like, last summer, summer, summer of 2020, he asked me, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yes. He said, are we in the end times? It seemed like it, didn't it, for a little while? It's funny how that wears off. The urgency sort of fades. The intensity. We get, it's, it, you can get used to anything. I've said before, there could be a lion standing in the back of the church and the first time you come into the sanctuary or gymnasium or whatever this room is called, you see the lion and you're a little bit freaked out. But after 52 Sundays, you just go, oh, yeah, there's the lion. They really believed John was a harbinger of the end times, but it's hard to keep that high alertness going when, when the years just keep passing by like they've always done. No matter how you interpret the details of the book of Revelation, and we won't get into that right now, no matter how you interpret those details, the book of Revelation does reveal, and many agree, that God has a timeline. God has a plan. A specific schedule that says something about what will happen between Jesus' first advent and his final advent, his coming as king and ruler, when he comes to claim his kingdom. In other words, God knows that time is running out for this world, and it started running out almost 2,000 years ago. We are living on the threshing floor. The king is at the city gates. Are you prepared? Or are you sort of banking everything on wishful thinking that you will never be held accountable for your sins? Not everyone who went to see John took this message to heart. We've just seen that, that John arrived before Jesus. We've seen that John prepared people for Jesus. Now we come to the third section of this text, this is where we see how John showed people the only way to be saved from the wrath of God is Jesus. This is in verses 7 to 12. I think it was my mom, I had this memory of it, but I, I think it was her that used to tell this story of a great big snake on the road in Colombia when she was driving my brother and myself in the back seat and and she either had to drive over the snake or around it, depending on the size. I don't remember the details of the story. And she doesn't seem to remember that story. But this is different. What we read here in verse 7. As John is metaphorically paving the way for Jesus, preparing a highway for our God. He doesn't see a giant python on the road or any boa constrictor or something like that. He sees a nest of baby vipers in the middle of the highway. And his question to those baby vipers embarrasses them. Look at verse 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood, which means a nest of babies, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? His question embarrasses them. You see, verse 7 simply says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to John's baptism. Not to get baptized. It seems like Matthew probably would have said they came to be baptized if they were coming to be baptized. But he says they just came to the baptism. As if they're spectators, as if they're curious, as if they just want to see what's going on, what all the fuss is about. But they don't take it that seriously. I think it means that they were coming because they didn't believe him, but they just didn't want to be ignorant of what he was doing. And the way John challenges them, brood of vipers. Yes, we're thousands of miles away and thousands of years later speaking different languages, but that was not a compliment. 
even then. And he asks them, who warned them to flee? And that puts them into a corner. Either they accept that John is the forerunner announced in Isaiah and Malachi, which they surely know about, they know about those prophecies, or they alienate all the people who do believe it. Should they, you can almost see their little brains turning, the wheels in their little brains, should they try to convince all the people that John is not a true prophet from God? Or should they rather join all the people and go along with it, confessing their sins and give away the fact that they know too well, but they don't want others to know that they are terrible sinners just like everyone else? What does John advise them? Verse 8. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's his command to the nest of baby snakes. That's what he says. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't just put on a show of repenting. Repent in a way that leads to change in how you live and how you serve God. Turn from self and sin to God and grace and keep it up. Bear fruit in keeping with means consistent with or appropriate to heartfelt, genuine, internal repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart. Turn from self and sin to God and grace and bear the kind of fruit that should come from that kind of turn. So look at verse 9. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for, for Abraham. The religious rulers of Israel, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these two political and theological parties, they prided themselves on being the chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, devoting themselves to obeying all the laws of their people and the tradi traditions of their people for the reason that they wanted God to see them, them as righteous, God to see their holiness and reward them. But John, John knew what they didn't want to accept, that he really is God's forerunner. And where they saw themselves as saints following God's ways, John saw them as snakes in God's way. Nobody's ethnic heritage guarantees any favor from God. That shouldn't be news to us. So John gets people to look around them, and John points out the rocks. They're in the wilderness. There's going to be a lot of rocks. And points out the trees. I guess there are trees in the wilderness there too. He points out these things on the hillsides of Judah, and he makes an example here of the religious bigwigs. Object lesson number one. It's as if John says, take a look at these rocks out here in the desert. And John makes a pun in Hebrew, because in Hebrew, children are banim, my pronunciation, I have no idea. But children are Benim and stones are ebony. So he makes a pun here. Look at verse 9. Right in the middle of the verse, I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. God is able from these Ebonim to raise up Benim for Abraham. He's not pulling any punches. Using a little bit of humor, sure, but not pulling punches. It's like he's implying that if they don't repent of their sins, the very rocks that they're walking on have a better chance of getting into heaven, of being the kind of people God will accept than they do. They for sure knew that Isaiah had also described Abraham as that rock from which the people of Israel were carved, and the quarry from which the people of Israel were dug. And it would not be hard for God to start over with brand new rocks from elsewhere. We find out later that the gospel did go to the Gentiles. Object lesson number two. Look at the fruit trees. I have no idea whether there were fruit trees in that part of the land at all. I don't know. But it is the object lesson that John chooses here. Later in chapter 7, Jesus uses the same illustration to make exactly the same point. 
A point that they would recognize comes from passages like Isaiah 10 and Isaiah 11. The point, if they do not produce the righteous fruit God expects, he will raise the whole forest and leave the land of Israel like a clear cut. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Even the Jews needed to repent. Even the religious Jews needed to repent. Even the leaders of the religious Jews, maybe we should say especially the leaders of the religious Jews, needed to repent. Everyone urgently needed to turn from self and sin to God and His grace before time ran out for them. And the fact that John arrived before Jesus as promised, as predicted, and warned people to repent and did what the Scriptures said He would do, that fact is a pretty good reason to believe that God is still on schedule. That even today God is still on time with the plan He has for the end times. Right? So what? What's the big deal? Who cares? Everyone needs to repent. Christians need to repent. Pastors need to repent, maybe especially pastors. In fact, that's what Christians do. That's the breathing of being a Christian. Repent. How often do you need to breathe? I do it again. Repent. Douglas O'Donnell is a former Protestant pastor. He didn't grow up in a Protestant church like ours. And maybe that, that sort of being a bit of an outsider coming in and becoming a Protestant pastor eventually, maybe that gives him a perspective that helps him to see what, something we might not wish to see about ourselves. He says it this way. Having come from a Roman Catholic upbringing into the evangelical world, if you were to ask me, in your opinion, and from your experience, what's the biggest problem with the Catholic Church, I would say the Bible is little taught and it is even less understood. But do you know what I'd say for the evangelical church? I'd say the sin of presumption. This is the very sin that causes John to use some of the harshest language found in the Bible for these religious leaders. We think presumptuously. If I just half-heartedly did the first step of repentance, if I once in my life, maybe at some summer camp or Billy Graham crusade, confessed my sins, then I'm okay. I'm going to heaven even if I live like hell. That's what he said. Christians... Never stop needing to hear the Bible preached by preachers who will call us, and I mean us, on our sins and, and point us again to Jesus. When Jesus' apostles preached in the book of Acts, the, they always called their hearers to repent. Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 5.31, God exalted Jesus at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 8.22, Repent therefore of this wickedness. Acts 17.30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Acts 26.20, Paul said, I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the nations, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Acts 11.18, those who heard the gospel repented, and it says, When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the nations also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And the letters in the New Testament, written to churches, continually call 
for humility and repentance and confession of sin by Christians. A true Christian repents. That's what Christians do. My dear brothers and sisters, do not grow weary of repenting. Grow weary of sinning. Turn from sin and self to God and his grace and never, ever stop. That's why John the Baptist didn't end his sermon there. He pointed his hearers to the one who was coming after him. Just like Matthew points his readers to that one, to Jesus, right after these verses. But of all the prophets God ever sent to Israel, John was the greatest. Jesus said so. And he was the last. He was the prophet heralding the coming of God. John's preaching, it shook the nation, right? From the commoners to the king, he rocked the religious establishment. But the power of his preaching, according to his own testimony, is nothing compared to the power of the one he preached. Look at verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Everything was about to change. John the Baptist preached to Jews who, and it's, it's ironic, isn't it? Jews who accepted the writings of the prophets as Holy Scripture. Meanwhile, their ancestors were the very ones who killed the prophets. That's the people he preached to, the descendants of those people, and now they accepted what their, their grandfathers persecuted. But, but John the Baptist didn't care what would happen to him. He didn't care if he ended up like one of those slain prophets. He didn't care whether anyone ever accepted John the Baptist. His mission wasn't about him, was it? He was not serving himself. He was serving his king from heaven. And that's who he preached. Opposition didn't stop him. Prison didn't stop him. Death threats didn't stop him. Only once the son of King Herod, the other King Herod, beheaded John, only then did that king succeed in silencing the mouth of that preacher. But his preaching lives on. I've heard that an irritated woman once asked of the preacher and evangelist George Whitfield why he was constantly telling people that they must be born again. And Whitfield turned to her and said, Madam, because you must be born again. If that was John the Baptist, he would have irritated a lot of people. I'm sure some Jewish woman came and said, why are you constantly telling us to repent? And John would have said, Madam. And then on one of those occasions when John was preaching, when he was preaching the arrival of the King from heaven and he was baptizing sinners who repented, he spotted a man in the crowd. He saw one person there in that crowd who did not need to repent. John had been sent to get people ready for that man. And that man came to bring repentant sinners to God. To baptize with the spirit and fire, John said. Around three years later, when that man had finished his ministry, and you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus. After he was arrested by those very religious leaders, after he was tried and executed by the Romans on a wooden cross, when death itself couldn't silence him, death itself couldn't hold him, death itself could not keep him, he rose and ascended to the right hand of the throne of God in glory. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to give the very life of God to everyone who believes in him. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. 
And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Only God can promise to baptize people with God. And Matthew has clearly shown what John clearly preached, that the one John heralded was more than merely a Messiah, more than merely a Messiah to save the Jews from the Romans, more than merely a leader to show you the way to heaven, a guru or guide to show you the way, more than even a redeemer sent by God to save you, like Moses from, with the Israelites from Egypt. He's more than that. The King John preached and that Matthew proclaims is no mere man. He is God. And this implication of all that is said here in this passage, this is it. Therefore, the kingdom that is coming is a kingdom not of this earth. It is a kingdom from heaven. Because the king who is coming is the Son of God. And my dear, dear friends, until Jesus accepts you, and until Jesus gives you God's Spirit, you are not ready for what's coming. So now, what must you do? Repent and believe the good news. John says, live your life bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Live your life for the sake of your King in, this, in the power of His Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How we need to be reminded. Bear the fruit that brings God glory, the fruit of the Spirit. Again, Paul in Galatians 5, that fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These aren't all the fruits, but these are some of them. These are gifts that distinguish God's holy people from the rest. The wheat from the chaff. As verse 12 says, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Father, we ask for the Spirit. We fully believe, Lord, that everyone whom you bring to your Son, whose ears you open to his gospel, whose eyes you open to give him sight to see who Jesus is as Lord and King and Savior, we fully believe that you give faith in the hearts of those who hear this gospel so that we respond with, with belief. And we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to stir up in us fruit, the kind of fruit that belongs to those people who repent. We ask for the evidence of changed lives, of changed hearts, of changed minds, of changed thinking, of changed values, of changed priorities, of new love and gentleness and kindness and holiness and self-control and patience. We ask, Lord, to do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. Oh, give us your Holy Spirit in greater measure, I pray, that we might more live as people who bring honor and glory to our King while we wait for his appearing. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.